Good evening. One more time. Good evening. I want to uh, thank you and welcome you to, I believe, the fourth or fifth annual. Can everyone hear me? I want to welcome everyone to our, I believe, our fourth or fifth annual Overdevelopment Forum. Uh, I'm Council Member uh, Ben Kalos, and I want to thank everyone who came out tonight. Uh, we believed we were going to have about 140 seats. Uh, we learned today that they could only fit in 110 because the other chairs were being used at other events here tonight. That being said, there is standing room. In addition, we actually film almost all of our events. Uh, so uh, your comments tonight will be filmed. If uh, you get tired of standing and uh, need to go home, it will be up on YouTube probably tomorrow and available through benkalos.com. And uh, we would be live streaming if I had more data left on my phone this uh, month. Uh, so I want to thank everyone for being here. Uh, and so you'll be hearing a lot of information tonight, regardless of your perspective on this issue. We can all agree there's a problem in this area with overdevelopment, and the status quo is unacceptable. We've been fighting together for four and a half years, and many in this room longer than that to preserve our residential neighborhood from rezoning the Sutton area to East Harlem. Zoning should provide predictability and reliability so we know what types of buildings can go up in which neighborhoods. When we start building super tall buildings that are also super skinny because the zoning for that lot only restricts density but not height, we're getting an unintended consequence, not one that anyone ever predicted. And so I've supported the 200 foot, 210 foot height cap being proposed by Community Board 8 and I'm working hard to close the loopholes like excessive mechanical voids and floor to ceiling heights. We're also working with neighborhood groups like East 79th Street Neighborhood Association, represented this evening by uh, their president emeritus, Betty Cooper Wallerstein. And this group has a petition I'd like you to check out at their table. And if the folks at the table can uh, wait, if, if Betty, if you can wave your hand so folks can turn around and wave, Betty is going to wave her hand one more time. That's, that's Betty right there, so please consider signing her petition. And uh, if you didn't know, I'm strongly opposed to super tall buildings, and I don't believe very tall skyscrapers belong in residential neighborhoods. But whether or not you agree with me, you shouldn't see a built landscape of unintended consequences and exploited uh, loopholes. I want to thank uh, some of our co-hosts tonight our state senator Liz Kruger and our Manhattan Borough President Gail Kruger, both of whom will likely be joining us tonight. And the reason they are my co-hosts is um, taking on real estate developers is not something that politicians usually do. Usually politicians have their hands out to the developers taking campaign cash from them. And so when you turn to other elected officials and say, we are going to do something that's never been done before, and uh, we're going to tilt at a windmill, but we may actually end up slaying a dragon, and you have two elected officials who are willing to put their own political careers on the line, are willing to put their own political relationships on the line, and fight tooth and nail for your rezoning and for your neighborhood, that is why they are co-hosts, because you'll hear a little bit more with the East River 50s Alliance, but I couldn't have done it without the support of the borough president and our state senator, so they deserve a round of applause. We also have co-sponsors who have been partners in the fight every step of the way, Quite crucial in our rezoning was our Congress member, Carol Maloney, who uh, stepped in to just push us over the finish line with our mayor and try to help us get it done, as well as our state senator, Serrano, assembly members, Court and Seawright, and uh, our new council member, uh, just west of me, and council member, Keith Powers. I want to thank Lenox Hill Neighborhood House for uh, opening their doors to this event. 
every single year. And I encourage Eastsiders to check out the programming here. Uh, in the back of the room, you'll see tables for Friends of the Upper East Side Historic District, Carnegie Hill Neighbors, Municipal Art Society, East River Fifties Alliance, Community Board 8, City Toss, East 7th Night Street Neighborhood Association, and from our East Side electeds. Uh, make sure to pick up their materials before heading out tonight. After we hear from our elected officials and partner organizations on the many topics around the issue of overdevelopment, there will be a panel-style Q&A. At this point, you should have an index card. If you don't have an index card or you need a new index card, you can hold your hand up and somebody will come to bring you an index card. If you have finished your question, uh, hold up your index card and uh, somebody will come and collect it from you. We will then try to group your index cards together and uh, we'll try to group the questions uh, together. Anything we don't get to by 8 o'clock tonight, we will keep, so you should, if you want, an answer, uh, and, you're, and you're, you can put in questions anonymously, but if you want to make sure you get the an answer, uh, you can write your information, your email, your phone number, and we will get back to you in the next couple of days. And uh, I think we will be joined by elected officials as the course of the evening. I know that our assembly member, or our Senator is driving down from Albany, as likely as our assembly member. Uh, so um, I just want to take one other moment to just talk about a little bit of how we got here. So people talk about problems all the time, and you can have forums where you can talk more about it. But I really felt like we knew what the problem was, but we weren't really doing anything. There were huge victories in terms of getting RAB, which protects the heights in the mid blocks at around 75 feet. And we have R10A, which protects the height at 72nd, 79th, 86th, 96th, which all happen to be our widest streets, which is kind of counterintuitive. And that was hard won by friends and Civitas, I believe, back in the 80s during the 19th. 83 or 86 uh, uh, zoning amendments. Hmm? Yes, <laughs> but since then the developments continued. So, as an elected official, I have member item funding. It's your tax dollars, and one of the things that I did is I started investing my tax dollars with friends of the Upper East Side Historic District, with Civitas, and I said, and I said to them, I need you to do a study. I need you to go out and figure out what's wrong and give me a specific way to fix it. I'm not allowed to tell them what the answer was. That being said, that didn't stop me from saying, hey, I really like that 210-foot height cap that we've been working with our uh, Elizabeth Ashby and the Lane Walsh, who are chairs of the Land Use Committee at CD8. So I, sorry, zoning, not land use, uh, committees of CD8. That being said, they the money was used properly and they both come back with different studies and uh, we're trying to move forward at the same time as they were doing that study a billion a developer showed up and said they wanted to tear down buildings with affordable housing that seniors like uh, Charles Hernandez and Herman Worth was living in in rent stabilized apartments and displacing them so that they could build buildings for billionaires and so I joke, sometimes I say there's a problem when millionaires are being gentrified out of their own neighborhoods for billionaires. Um, but the truth is, what we're really talking about is octogenarians who have been in the neighborhood for longer than many of us have been alive. They have made the neighborhood what it is. They're living on fixed income. Uh, some are even in poverty. And those are the folks that make our neighborhood economically diverse, and those are the folks that are being displaced. And so the developer back in 2015 said that they were going to be done before we could do anything, and we got the area rezoned before they could finish their foundation. Yeah. And now we're fighting their appeal because why should they have to follow the law? They clearly didn't follow many laws before since then. So uh, you'll get an update on it, but we're going to keep fighting any development that is out of scale with the neighborhood. Uh, so that was 58 Sutton. So it is 58th Street between Sutton Place and First Avenue. 
It is actually one of the only places in my district where you can build in a mid-block at unlimited heights. And believe you me, the developer wanted to go up to, I think, 1,400 feet. So I believe we have about five to 10 minutes per presenter. And uh, if you can join me in welcoming Okay, before we go to our panelists, we have uh, from Assemblymember Rebecca Seawright's office. Uh, it seems like she will not make it down from Albany just in time, but we have Rebecca Graham, her counsel, uh, who would like to say a few words on her behalf. Good afternoon. My name is Rebecca Graham, and I am at service legislative counsel. Microphone. I serve as legislative counsel to Rebecca Seawright. Um, she, they were in chambers today till almost 5 o'clock debating, so uh, she asked me to come today to speak to you. Uh, thank you very much to Borough President Gail Brewer, State Senator Liz Kruger, and Councilmember Ben Kalos for hosting this very important forum on overdevelopment in our community. We are so fortunate here in the Upper East Side to have community organizations such as Friends of the Upper East Side, Civitas, the East River 50s Alliance, and Community Board 8, who are especially diligent in their efforts to preserve the character and fabric of our community. They deserve great credit for the work they do on behalf of all of us. On behalf of Assemblymember Seawright, I want to acknowledge and thank our elected officials, Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney, State Senator Jose Serrano, and Council Member Keith Powers for co-sponsoring this event. Many of you are here tonight for the same reason that Assembly Member C. Wright co-sponsored. We're shocked and appalled by the lengths that developers will take to bend the rules to build taller and ruin the character of this neighborhood. In the past few years, they have seen projects like 180 East 88th Street that includes voids of dead space and 16 foot high luxury ceilings to boost height without increasing the number of floors. This quite literally casts a billionaire shadow over our community and sets a dangerous precedent to anyone who cares about neighborhood and affordable housing. In a city where space comes at a premium, it's rehensible to have this much wasted space in the heart of Manhattan and in our neighborhood. That very same project created a sham lot so they could claim no street footage, take more air rights, and build as tall as they please. We cannot sit idly by while developers continue to take advantage. We must call on the city to take this issue seriously and support, as Rebecca C. Wright and Senator Kruger did, a resolution to cap the height of new buildings at 210 feet. We're not against development, we're against development over development. We are against development that wastes space and makes it even harder for people to live in this community. Height for height's sake is not good policy, and we must stay diligent to fight against policies that hurt us and radically change the way our neighborhoods look and feel. In Albany, we have seen numerous proposals to remove restrictions on FAR capped by state law. The current cap protects us against larger buildings and increased density, not just in this neighborhood, but throughout our city. Senator Kruger and Assemblymember Seawright opposed these measures to eliminate the cap when they came before us three years ago, and they are committed to opposing them again. The Upper East Side has the highest measurable density as a residential neighborhood, and it's time to say enough is enough. I want, the Assembly Member wants every one of you to know that she's here in this fight with you and will not stop fighting until these practices are stopped. Assembly C. Wright looks forward to a lively and engaging discussion in our community turn the outrage into action. Thank you so much. I want to thank my young staff and uh, interns for their help tonight in getting this set up. Uh, they pointed out to me that uh, we actually have a, a number of folks in the audience who look younger than some of the other folks in the audience. 
So we're asking that if you feel that you are able to stand for two hours or just grab a seat on the floor, which would be a big deal and you happen to be young, it's actually just kind of important for those of us who are young to give up our seat to folks who might be pregnant or uh, older and, and can use those seats and then regardless of whether you got here sooner or later, if you don't mind uh, self-nominating yourself if you're interested to grab a seat if you feel that it will help you sit for, stay through for the event and uh, we appreciate it. Uh, so thank you. Um, Councilman Kellogg, before we get too far into this, I'm already noticing a narrative being established here. And that is, and while I, I recognize... So we've got index cards, uh, and, and, and we... Nobody is wandering around handing them out. Uh, raise your hand and somebody will come over. One person's over there. We'll send folks to you. Just please be patient. There's a narrative here. And, and so... Uh, and so please just write your question on the uh, index card. We will get it to you. I, I will get your message. I'm happy to listen to you outside, but I'd like to get the event uh, going. And uh, I want to thank everyone for their piece. So um, the other key thing is, as you're paying attention, the one question is, well, we're getting a lot of different ways that we can be involved, and that's what we're hoping for. So we're hoping that you will like something you hear tonight, and you'll say, I like what this organization is doing, and I want to support this organization either by being a member or by supporting them financially or what have you. Tell All us the what folks. Doing as opposed to thank you. What, you. what are we doing about that? What are we doing about preserving affordable housing instead of a Sure. So we will we will get to the presentations right now. So let's start by welcoming our first presenter from the Municipal Arts Society, Robert Joseph. He will be presenting on the accidental skylines and giving a broad overview of the issues. He will outline how we got here to this point where here super talls are threatening residential neighborhoods. That will be followed by East River 50s Alliance. We'll stop and talk about their rezoning efforts. Friends will actually, sir, the Friends of the Upper East Side Historic Districts will actually talk about how they would like to preserve affordable housing by closing loopholes. And uh, then we'll go on to Civitas, which will talk about uh, how contextual skylines can provide, provide predictability and, again, stop some of the overdevelopment, followed by uh, CV8. So all of the folks should be touching on it, but it will be framed first by Municipal Arts Society, who have actually been fighting this fight for generations. So if you can please join me in welcoming Municipal Arts Society. Thank you, Council Member I'm Robert Joseph. I'm a planner, a city planner, and project manager at the Municipal Art Society. I'm also your neighbor. Uh, last, last November, the Municipal Art Society of New York, we released the second version of our Accidental Skyline Report. And that report highlights the fact that while tall buildings are and, have all, are and will always be a critical part of New York City, um, in the last five years especially, we've seen the development and the rise of what we call super tall buildings. And super tall buildings are buildings that are technically over 600 uh, feet tall, but they're also out of scale, they're unpredictable, and in a lot of cases they haven't been planned for. They're, uh, they're buildings that pop up in neighborhoods across the city. Uh, we're a citywide organization and we look at this not only on the Upper East Side, but all over New York City. And I'm going to uh, share a couple points from that, uh, that report with you today. So some of the problems that have led to the development of these super tall buildings uh, are outdated zoning regulations. Uh, here on the Upper East Side, some of the zoning regulations are still from 1961. They haven't been amended in over 50 years, and that's led to significant problems. Um, there are deficient environmental review processes. They're, the environmental review and disclosure documents, they don't adequately and accurately depict what's going to happen in the development uh, that is uh, projected from the, those documents. Um, and finally, there's a lack of effective public input. Um, some of my uh, colleagues here are going to touch on some of the other issues, but I'm going to touch a little bit more on uh, deficient environmental review. This was a proposal um, for uh, the Time Warner Center by, um, by Central Park. And essentially, 
a lot of environmental review processes like this one did not adequately uh, project the shadow impact that this building would have. They don't project a lot of the impacts that these buildings will have, and in some cases, they don't project the fact that these buildings will get built at all. And that's a problem, because our neighborhoods, if we don't have predictability in zoning, we can't adequately plan for the future in terms of our infrastructure, our schools, uh, and our ability to support these, these buildings. And uh, that creates a critical problem. Uh, one big rezoning that recently happened is the Greater East Midtown rezoning. And uh, all these buildings in blue and red, they were the potential for projected development sites in the, in the Greater East Midtown rezoning. And uh, this, the environmental disclosure document projected where they would be. But I want you to guess, where was the first building that uh, is planned to be uh, demolished and developed anew? Where is it on this map? Have it's not Grand Central. It's actually none of them. They actually put the guess wrong. The one in uh, it's the one in red over here. It's the Union Carbide Building at 270 Park. And it means this is emblematic of how our environmental disclosure processes. They're not only underestimating the development that's going to happen. They they don't even guess where it's going to happen. We're completely blindsided by some of the developments that occur across the city. The Union Carbide Building at 270 Park, it was identified as a building that warranted protection. It was not supposed to be redeveloped. It was supposed to be potentially landmarked and protected for future generations. And instead, there are plans to redevelop this building. And this is emblematic of, of the development regime that we're seeing now. How none of it, none, these super tall buildings, that they are unpredictable and they create undue impact on our neighborhood. Um, in, uh, in 2004, uh, downtown Brooklyn was rezoned, and uh, there were certain projected and potential development sites there as well. Uh, I apologize that the date is off, but this is, this is what it will look like in 2020. It, you can see that a lot of these developments were not supposed to or expected to happen. Uh, in fact, you can see all of the buildings in pink, or all the parts of the buildings in pink, were not expected to happen. Our environmental review processes, they are deficient because they can't adequately project where development is going so to happen. Why don't you stop? Yeah. We are working on it. We're trying to figure no, out no, how old it's going to be. Why don't you stop it? Well, I appreciate we your comments, sir. We'll, we'll get to that at the end. Not they, we. Sir, please yeah. let us continue. I've got neighbors got dead right answer, now due so to this kind of baloney. If, 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 if the pace of the agenda is important. You are happy to go over with you, or you can watch the video on YouTube. Mr. Co Jared Kushner owns my building. I have people dead from asbestos exposure because your people won't come and enforce the law. They won't even let me file a criminal complaint against him. Sir, we're, we're happy to help. My chief of staff is right there. Right. Work with you. I called your office. Oh, yeah, don't embarrass him. He's got people to thank. These, these developments were not predicted. Projected, and if we can't predict where development is going to occur in our neighborhood, right. how can we plan for that? How can we build schools for the children that will need the school? Parks. How can we build an infrastructure to, to support all of the all of the new development that's happening? Sure. And as uh, Rebecca from uh, uh, Rebecca from uh, Assemblywoman C. Wright's office mentioned, uh, there is a bill before the state senate right now to lift the FAR cap to allow more development to happen than is already occurring right now. And they, they, uh, the state, uh, the state senate, the rationale they're using is that there are already adequate protections for uh, against these developments. And as I've shown you, there clearly are not adequate protections. We can't even predict where these buildings are going to be built. And in fact, the Upper East Side is very vulnerable to this kind of a policy. You can see that a lot of the Upper East Side is already at the maximum floor area ratio of 12, um, and is at risk of potentially seeing even more development. Fortunately, we think that the threat from this, uh, from this bill is not likely to happen in the session, but um, I encourage you to contact your state legislators if you do have the ability. Um, so these are tremendous problems, and we're really concerned about these loopholes. We have a couple solutions, um, closing the loopholes that developers use to skirt regulations. Um, Lisa Mercurio will talk a little bit about that in a bit. Um, give neighborhoods a seat at the table. That's you. We want you all to have the ability to participate in this process, to be able to understand and uh, provide real input that has real impacts on how this development happens, not only in, our, in this neighborhood, but in neighborhoods across the city. And finally, we need to hold developers accountable to the public interest. These buildings, they're not affordable housing. 
they are buildings for luxury, uh, luxury buyers. They are not providing the new housing that we need. And we need to make sure that we're holding these developers accountable to, uh, to our standards and our values. If you... How do we achieve those recommendations? We have a, I mean, a big report online, and um, oh, yeah. okay, we're afraid that the city of today will become a lot darker and drearier, and we have a lot of these recommendations laid out in our Accidental Skyline Report, and I encourage all of you to take a look. We've identified these problems in depth, and we've also discussed a number of the solutions as well. Um, also, feel free to reach out to the organization if you have any. And we have over 100 people here, so why don't you tell us what we should do? Now. Uh, 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 I'd like for you to ask a question, and then we'll absolutely... I, I, so, again, if you are angry after this presentation, that is the right feeling to have. Yes. And we want to thank the Municipal Arts Society for their role in this presentation was to start off by helping us know what the problem was. So thank you. Uh, we will be joined by our state senator and our Manhattan Borough President. And uh, which one was Pat? And our state senator, Liz Kruger, uh, will go first. Um, it is so important you're all here, and Ben is right, if you're angry, that's the right attitude to have, because as I just came in and watched the accident the skyline, it is something that fundamentally terrifies me for the future of our city and our neighborhoods, and many of us are trying to move forward with more strict restrictions, changes in zoning. There was just a reference to the proposed bill for the doing away with the 12 FAR in Albany, and I represent people in Albany. We have killed that bill for this year. Some people are actually up in Albany having a round table. Um, Revenue is pushing this hard. The Municipal Arts Society was up there at the meeting, and afterwards, um, the people who actually are trying to get this through came to me with me and said, okay, we lost again this year, you've won, we won't give up. I said, I'm not giving up either. either. Um, so we have to hold strong in Albany. We have to get more serious urban planning and rational zoning um, for our communities. And I'm just delighted that I have such strong partners in government at the federal, state, and local level. Obviously, most of land use and zoning issues are with city government. Um, I personally feel I could have better partners than Ben Kalos or our borough president, Gail Brewer. Hold strong and move us in the right direction. So I just want to thank you all for being here and thank all of the speakers here tonight on the panel. And the more information we have, the more education we have, the stronger we can become fighters. And I mean everyone in this room. So thank you. Just to be clear what Senator Kruger stopped in Albany, with 12 times a floor area ratio, you're only supposed to just literally get about 12 stories. If you use half the lot, that's 24 stories. At 12 FAR, we are seeing buildings at 1,400 feet tall, and they want to get rid of the 12 cap, which means they could do 20, they could do 20, they could do 40, they could do 100, they could put up the Burj Khalifa wherever they want. And the only reason that isn't happening in Albany is State Senator Liz Kruger. And our partner, uh, who is supporting our community boards and all of the land use that we're working on here, our Manhattan Borough President, Gail Brewer. Thank you, Ben. And I also want to thank Ben Kalos, because in the budget, there's a lot more money for each community board. And I want to thank you very much, Ben, because that's a big deal for the budget. <laughs> Hopefully, we we'll have some planners and people who can work on land. So, big deal. $4.3 million for the community board. Congratulations. So, thank you, uh, your council member, your wonderful state senator. And this issue of overdevelopment, I've been working on it as a council member for 12 years and now as borough president for 
five, almost five years, and I remember when I first came into the Borough Presidency, there was a proposal to make a big, huge tower in the middle of the historic South Street Seaport, and I said, hell no. And there's no tower, and there never will be a tower. So there is, when you're organized like you are, it, it makes a difference. Um, and then working with your wonderful elected officials, with Ben Cables, Liz Cougar, and others, we have been working on trying to preserve the residential character of Sutton Place. I want to say that that group of people, and you may be here tonight, has been phenomenal. It's expensive, it's hundreds of meetings, and they have learned a lot, but spent a lot and worked a lot. And it's really been a phenomenal effort on their part, and I want to thank them. And it's been two steps forward, one step back, and constant, constant threats in terms of the proposal to build. Um, so we're still fighting on that issue. We proposed uh, contextual zoning with a height limit and affordable housing coming from that community. I was really livid that the City Planning Commission did not accept that. You know what, Mr. Mayor and company, you want to diversify neighborhoods, you want to have schools that are diverse, you should have accepted it. City Planning did not. So we achieved a compromise with the City Planning Commission, thanks to the council member, to apply a tower on a base, uh, rules to the area which had the practical impact effect of limiting the kind of height that was initially proposed. But it doesn't include the kind of wonderful proposal that this group suggested. And we've been now twice at the uh, Board of Standards and Appeals trying to, and we're going back again to make sure that what is suggested happens in a large fight that continues. Uh, we also are fighting uh, down uh, near Manhattan and Williamsburg bridges. There are huge three towers proposed for that area. I know it's not here, but just to give you a sense of the challenges that we're facing, that was a situation where the city said, oh, you don't need a ULIP, you can just do an EIS. And you heard earlier about what that means, just even when it's combined with a ULIP. So in that case, we're working with Margaret Chin. We're trying to change the law, and the, without giving you all the details, we've, We've gotten halfway to be able to have the potential of a Europe. Doesn't so mean we stop the three towers, but it means the community board and the community have input. Right now, we have none. Our 1961 zoning resolution, as you heard earlier, never contemplated some of the development we're seeing today. These ridiculously tall towers, oversized development from the numerous lot mergers that you heard about from the council member. And so just like you, and I thank you for so many people turning out community efforts to rein in open development and make sure that future development is balanced with preservation of community character and reasonable scale is all we're asking for. And I know you have varied proposals. Again, I want to thank those from the east side who have been working tirelessly day after day that would impose height limits. These are great ideas, and if I was in charge of the universe, I would agree with you and do it, but I'm not. Neither is the council member, neither is the uh, senator, so we have to keep pushing. Uh, we fought for two years in Sutton Place for zoning that would limit the height of what was really a residential neighborhood. It is ridiculous that you apply these heights in a residential neighborhood, but we didn't gain traction with the Department of City Planning. But the fight had some benefits because it resulted in some progress, I always say some, uh, there were additional steps we should be taking that might result in more immediate results. You'll hear from others, from Rachel Levy, and I love friends of the Upper East Side and Civitas. They've been doing a great job. But the abusive practices that were clearly not contemplated by the zoning resolution, like the 100 feet of dead space where they put mechanicals, these developers put the mechanicals right in the middle of the building, 20-foot floor to ceiling lights, the gerrymandering of zoning lots and other tricks are used by developers to increase the building height. All of that should go away. They should, we should have much more information about the zoning lots. We shouldn't have the 20 foot floor to ceiling heights. And we shouldn't have the mechanicals in the middle because all they do is make it taller so that they can get better views and more money outweighs. We need transparency, as you heard earlier, around the zoning lot mergers. In certain places, the developer kept assembly lots to the point that co-ops in the area were debating selling their assets to the developer. We need to know when these mergers are occurring as a first step to determine if a certain threshold of lot merger activity should or could trigger some kind of a response. 
So what we're doing, I have to say, as a positive, I introduced a bill with the public advocate, and we've been supported by the Speaker of the City Council for a real charter revision commission for all of city government to be reviewed. The mayor has a charter revision commission that will be on the ballot in November of this year, but it's just talking about campaign finance and some governance issues. I want something that talks uh, about much more. It has been signed by the mayor. It is in effect. It will be announced in a couple of weeks. We'll have borough, five borough hearings, three sets of them, and we'll look at land use because there'll be appointments from all five boroughs and all the elected officials will be gaining uh, traction in terms of information because we'll all have appointments. Um, that's when the community here and the community boards in the whole city can land use input. Because the way we do planning and public engagement, as you heard earlier, has not been examined in a comprehensive manner for decades. So you should all think about your testimony for that process. I want to congratulate the Upper East Side for all of your work. You'll hear a lot from the panel today. Um, I love working with you on these issues. It is frustrating. It is very frustrating. Je Jefferson Mao from my office, who is a professional urban planner, will be here all night. I want to thank the council member and all of you. I testify, I write letters, I advocate. It's frustrating, but I will be with you all the way. Thank you very much. to our borough president, Theo Brewer. She appoints the community boards. She stands behind them. She has the urban planners. And if you want to rezone, as we've done, to stop overdevelopment, she has a say in it, and she's been with our community every step of the way. So just one more thank you to our borough president, Theo Brewer. If you are a person who is having difficulty standing, there are three seats up here, so please feel free to come up. I also see another seat over there, so there's four seats if anyone needs it because they're having trouble standing. Uh, we're also joined by Councilmember Keith Powers, who represents uh, west of Lexington or 2nd Avenue on the east side and further south. Uh, so if you can join me in welcoming Councilmember Keith Powers. Thank you, and I, I think I'm a member of the community board many others, so I know that these are long nights ahead and a lot of discussion, so I will keep it very brief. First of all, I want to say hello and introduce myself. I see a lot of old friends from Community Board 8, Community Board 6, some others here as well, and thank you for both your continued work on behalf of the community, and that's where a lot of this work really starts, is looking at these projects on a project-by-project project basis, but also larger scale. Um, I'm lucky enough to take over for Dan Garodnik in the City Council starting this past January 1st. We actually passed our city budget today. Uh, very proud of that budget. But I also get the honor of working alongside both Councilmember Ben Palos and the Borough President Gail Brewer. And I say lucky because they are very smart and responsible voices in this city government. They get it. They really get it. And one of the first things we did, and I Gail mentioned it, was that we put forward a charter revision commission in the city. Both the mayor has his own. But well, we have one, the city council did, with the leadership of the borough president, to make sure that right now, in this moment, we can look at everything. We can look at things like campaign finance, where's the money going, Ben has been such a leader on things like lowering contribution limits in the city, take money out of politics. We can look at things like the land use process, we can look at community boards, we can give you a better voice, but we can only do that if we have a way to actually look at the charter, which is really our city's constitution. And uh, we are really in starting a process of updating it. So I would ask, first of all, for all the folks here to participate in that process as it moves forward. I will give you, I know all of us will share with you the information about what that will look like and that will, that will be like where the hearings are happening. But that's an opportunity. If you care about issues that are you're discussing tonight or other issues about the city, this is really a comprehensive review of the document that guides all the different processes in this city. Um, so please participate in that. The, the second thing, and I was told two minutes, so I'm trying to keep my, uh, my uh, time here. The second thing I say is, um, whatever your view is on development, whatever your view is on, on density and height and affordable housing, for me, and I want to thank the friends of Upper East Side and Civitas and others who have been saying this and will say it again, you got to play by the rules. And if we would create rules and we talk about things like mechanical void loopholes and gerrymandering zoning districts, to me, whatever the rules we put in place, and those are, those are things we have to discuss here as a community, 
what height should be like, what density should look like, what affordable housing should look like. We can't create rules and have people go around them and create their own loopholes within that. And you clap for that. Thank you. And um, so as we do all these processes, it's not just about, it is very much about what it should look like and what should be the sort of the, the context here, but really, we have to strengthen the rules we have. We have to have agencies in the city that enforce those rules, that listen to the elected officials when we point them out. We have to have good people. You can come out, you can clap for that. She's my best person right now. Uh, but you, but when, when, we, when we do this, we have to also make sure that we're resourcing things like community boards to be able to do their job, to have community planners on them to talk about the process in depth. But we also have to make sure the agencies are doing their job. City planning, Board of Standards Appeal, Department of Buildings, and so that's what something I've been looking at, and I know the others are too. So um, I look forward to seeing more tonight. Thank you. I always say, you can be anywhere on a Thursday night in New York City, and to be here and standing up and speaking on behalf of your community is one of the best and most important ways you can do it. So thank you for all of you for being here. Thank you to all the groups for your continued work and doing so much, the community board and all the different uh, civic organizations we're lucky to have here. And thank you to Councilmember Kalos for continuing to drive this conversation forward. Uh, I am not the lucky uh, luck to join him. So again, give him another big round of applause. Thank you. I want to thank everyone who's writing questions down on the index cards. So one of the questions that folks shouted out, as it were, was just, well, when are we getting to the meat and potatoes? So we started with, what's the problem? We're now going to talk about a model, a model that we built with our borough president and our state senator, where we decided to do a grassroots rezoning, a bottom-up, and that's the model. And that's what we have you here for. So we're going to ask East River 50s Alliance to talk about how they did what had never been done before, so you know what's at stake and what we're asking you to do with the three partners who are going to propose their solutions. And we're hoping that we can recreate what we did in the East River 50s in other parts of the district. So if you can please join me in welcoming Lisa Mercurio from the East River 50s Alliance. Good evening, everyone. Council Member Kalos, Borough President Gail Brewer. Keith Powers, I haven't met you yet, but I know you're out there, and I think um, our beloved state senator has already left the room. Thank you for inviting the East River 50s Alliance to participate in this critical forum. I am Lisa Mercuria, the Director of Communications. I'm a founding member of the East River 50s Alliance, and like each of you, a concerned citizen, an activist, Someone who cares about their neighborhood, this city, and is motivated to ensure that the East River 50s, in fact, the whole of New York City, remains a wonderful place to live. <laughs> After a well-publicized three-year battle, everyone's support, sweat, and time, all that our community has given up both financially and energetically, with 
with a major enviable victory in our pocket of contextual rezoning that the real people of the city of New York and many civic groups have applauded, I'm sure many are still asking the question, why are we still here? What's left to be done and why? What stories can we tell? Well, oh, it's a little bit different. That is the view of the super tall that they are still trying to build in the Sutton area community, if you could imagine such a thing. Our story begins in April 2015 when the whirring of surveying helicopters over tiny one-way East 58th Street tipped off a few residents into suspecting that something might be up or down, up in the sky that is. Soon word was confirmed that there was indeed a plan to build a thousand foot mega tower on a tiny narrow side street in New York City, the neighborhood known as Sutton Place, and all we could think was, how could this possibly be happening? It's like kind of crazy. Looks like it could break off and fall in, doesn't it? It's really an eyesore. A group of concerned citizens over a period of days and weeks mobilized to form the civic group now known as the East River 50s Alliance, and we were preparing for a fight. We knew that time was of the essence. No time to falter. No time for infighting. And why is that? Because a zoning battle ends when the developer completes the pouring of his concrete foundation, and our zoning clock was already ticking. Tick tock. New York City, 1961, where our real story begins. Yes, West Side Story was number one. Hazel, remember her? I bet you a lot of people here oh, remember Hazel. Bonanza and Gunsmoke were numbers one, two, and three on actual network TV, and Elvis was singing, Are You Lonesome Tonight? That's the time frame we're talking about, and that's when the zoning of the East River 50s was created and the big zoning handbook, as of right. In fact, our very own East Side Story. As of right, residential. For those of you who are new to zoning vernacular, you're hearing a lot of terms bandied about here today, that means the developer has the ability to build as big and as tall as they desire. As of right was actually an important zoning designation in the 60s because the city was eager, even desperate for new construction and housing, and given the inherent limitations of construction, and even more importantly, engineering capabilities, it was a relatively safe zoning assignment applied by the zoning aficionados of the day. But today, in as of right zoning districts, there is no public oversight or real review process. And in parts of the city where that zoning is still in place, a vulnerability, and as you've heard tonight, a loophole exists. Any developer that sees that opportunity can build as high as the sky. So, they blew my thunder. Last year, when I stood in front of this group, I had to say, we really don't know what's going to happen. We're really fighting. We're doing the best we can. But in November of 2017, due to the great efforts of our community and all of these fine elected officials, we won. We actually got our neighborhood rezoned. It was difficult, as you heard. It was years long to revise the city zoning law to protect residential side streets of the East River 50s. Previously, our community had all, had been the only residential neighborhood in the city in the city without protections against mega towers on quiet side streets. We're also the only community-led initiative, at least that I know of to date, to affect a new zoning change for their neighborhood. So, how did we do this? <coughs> ha! Do you remember, recognize a few of those people? <laughs> we have the unstinting support of our elected officials, all of who are here tonight, and all who co-signed our zoning application. Yet it still took more than two years and more than a million dollars, and it's still costing us money, a lot of money within our community to change the zoning law. One of the major pieces to change zoning law is community organization. It really takes a village, for real. No one person can do this. I can't tell you how many times I heard from people, how come I don't know anything about this? 
and I have often felt like you must be under a rock because we are literally out on the streets taking, taking petition names, calling people. We hold monthly town hall meetings because the essence of transparency is critical so that everyone knows what's happening so that you don't wake up and hear the whirring of helicopters and so that you don't just see this happening right underneath your nose. This takes legal expertise. We are currently on our second legal team and each, each group of lawyers actually specializes in different aspects of zoning and what it takes. Um, we worked with three zoning experts. We like to say that we had three different kinds of champagne in the house, but three different men that had great experience working with the Department of City Planning to try to develop the kind of zoning that we thought would really benefit the community. And that zoning included affordable housing, as the borough president just mentioned. That zoning included the kinds of limits that help to keep a city great. Um, we have, fortunately, a very concerned media in this city. We have media that's interested in telling the stories from the ground up. They'll get granular with you. They're interested in knowing what's happening in the lives of real New Yorkers. And really, it takes, it, it, it takes all of these different facets of making the zoning initiative happen. Um, and then, of course, there's fundraising. Never enough fundraising. Never enough money. Getting in and really discovering where your stakeholders are and figuring out how to make people care about what's happening in their own backyard. That is, that's a mission in and of itself. Um, and it was all of, these, all of these different things tied together that allowed us to carry the water. And I, I've got to tell you, there were moments when we were just like, we can't, we can't do this anymore. We're losing steam, but we never gave up hope. Things happen, it moves forward, everybody chugs everybody else along. There's always one core group that pushes and brings everybody else up. So as you've heard, we won, and we're so happy. But we, we took down a giant, right? And giants are not always gentle, and for in this case, developers. They're not so happy. <laughs> Sadly, and just like in fairy tales, giants um, don't take losing easily. And, and just like in Jack and the Beanstalk, we've yet to take the axe and whack down this mega tower for once and for all. Their plan all along was to make us fold, discourage us, run us amok, hope that financially and morally we'd lose hope. This developer, their lawyers, their lobbyists decided to use all their resources both financial and political, to fight back against this rezoning. And what have they done? They've staged an appeal. They've said, oh, it's so hard on us. You can't do this. You can't do this to us. You're ruining us. We're, we really mean well. They don't. Urpa will be facing the last stage in stopping this mega tower on the 19th of June. And you're all invited to come on down and show us that you care. This is our real fee fi fo fum moment. We are waiting for the time, so check the ERPA website. We will absolutely put it up there. We don't have an exact time on it yet. Uh, it is ERPA.NYC. E-R-F-A. The developer is Calico and the Gamma Group. on what you can accomplish because there are many developers that people could say the same thing about. Every developer comes from that perspective. There, it's all of a breed. It's all of a breed. But, you know, really, what are the real issues of overdevelopment? Like, how did we get here? Why mega towers? Why all this kind of stuff? Well, I, I could weigh you down with the real issues there. But the thing that really I find most interesting about mega towers, and, you know, it's the structural engineering possibilities exist now, yes. Legal possibilities exist now, yes. You're, you're hearing from everybody about transferring air rights and gerrymandering and slate of hand ingenuities and all of that. But the truth about mega towers is they really don't make a city better. They really don't make a city great. And recently I led a walk for Save Central Park NYC with my friend Sheila Kendrick, who is here from Save Central Park NYC in the back. And we 
stood in Central Park like this, facing south, and we couldn't find the skyline anymore. That's right. yeah. I invite you all to try it. It is blood curdling. That Saturday Night Live vision where you see the Essex house, and it's in your background and you can pick it out, you can't find it anymore. You really can't. This isn't maybe, ladies and gentlemen. This is happening. So mega towers, as a good thing, bringing commercial business and people, it's a myth. They're not good. Each building to be a mega tower, a thousand feet tall or higher, and this most important point that my friend Robert made, noted city planner George Jeans has said that the shadows cast by these towers could make temperatures too cold to be in Central Park. As a marathon runner here in this city, I'm telling you we're already feeling it. So here they are in all their beauty and splendor. 1550, 1550 feet, 217 West 57th. 1,400 feet, you already know this one, 432 Park Avenue. I want to show you something here. See that little spot right in the middle? Those are your mechanical voids that everybody's talking about. Nothing in there. That gives the developer the ability to go high, and there are some designated to come into your city right here in your neighborhood soon. Steinway Tower, 111 West 57, 1,400 feet. 1,300 feet, this one is not going to be done until 2020. One Vanderbilt, East 42nd Street, right there in the heart of Grand Central. And this is 157, yeah, 157, West 57, right? Just got cut off. So, with that, I'm going to close, leaving you visions of these looming, towering nightmares and 24 more skyscrapers that are anticipated to be, that are planned. What I want to say is that we proved in our battle to change the city's zoning as it applied to Urfa's community, a citizen-led initiative can make enormous improvements in the system. We can move forward and set a new standard and direction for development in New York City. Neighborhoods can take on developers to stop overdevelopment together we can open everyone's eyes to see that zoning laws must catch up with technology. Together, we can be the continued life of this great American city. And finally, as we at the East River 50s Alliance have always said, build it. But build it right, damn it. <laughs> I thank you. Your neighbors will thank you. And ultimately, the city of New York will thank you. Lisa for her very beautiful presentation. It takes an advertising person to put things into context. I want to also say that we've been joined by Michael Stinson from Scott Stringer's office. Can Michael, if you are here, you can uh, make sure to wave to folks. Uh, and so, uh, where, how, how did it happen? Literally, I was going with the founders of the East River 50s Alliance. I've been in every basement in the Sutton area. I've been to every annual board meeting. I still do that in your building where I'll come to your annual board. And we literally went to every single building and said, what is your capital reserve? Now, assume that you're caught in the shadow of somebody else and you're going to be in the shadow of billionaires. What is that worth to you? And for most folks, we said, set aside 10% of your capital reserve and use that to fund this effort. So we are hope any, any I, I see at least one building where I did a bet in your building in the East 79th Street area. Uh, and we're hoping that the boards of the buildings will reach into your pockets and then people who live in the building will too. Anyone here on your co-op or condo board? Okay, so we, we are looking to you to help and if you are, how many people live in a co-op or condo? We are looking to you to go to your leadership and bring this issue to them and say, if you want to be a part of solving the problem, we need you to join us. So the uh, next speaker we have is from Friends of the Upper East Side Historic District. I think they are going last. I think that somebody may have taken my uh, talking points, so we hopefully have a backup for a reason. Uh, our next speaker is Alita Camp, who is the new Community Board 8 Chair, who will be talking about 
the uh, R10A and the 210 foot pay cap that they are fighting for. and it makes sense. We, in representing the community, don't want buildings that overtower, that fill the landscape with high-end housing, have no regard for people who don't have the needs for that housing and don't want the unintended consequences of the housing. Let me just start by saying we are, include, we are starting to include, it's not there yet because we're working on the technology and the logistics, something on our website called Take Action. It will ask you to support, if you're interested, the community's board resolutions, which the first one will be the 210 foot height limit. It will provide names and addresses for you to write and call because voices do matter. The mayor has said 59 community boards in the city don't run the city, but we're going to prove him wrong and we're asking you to support him. have begun a charter revision commission committee to look at what's going on with the charter revision. We're concerned that the mayor may be using the charter revision, his own charter revision commission, to eliminate or diminish the role of community boards in land use decisions. I think there was a quote of someone on this commission, and we don't want that to happen. So the committee meetings will be posted on the CPA website, and there are already hearings. We urge you to attend the hearings. Again, let your voices be heard that community boards have a role and must have a role in not only land use but major city decisions. We are part of the city charter, and we don't want to have our role diminished. Um, in terms of the 210 foot height limit, in addition to being contextual, we're concerned about affordable housing. These buildings tear down the walk-ups, the former tenements, the elevator buildings, and replace them with towers where the developers say, yes, we're putting in affordable housing, but we don't believe it. We haven't seen the numbers. When we ask the builders to come to the community board, to our housing committee, to our zoning committee, and give us statistics, they don't. They either show up and don't have any information, or they don't show up at all. We're concerned that people of all means should have a place to live in Community Board 8 and throughout the city, and we just are not convinced that that's happening. We don't see numbers, we don't see statistics, we don't have any proof. The building that Extel wants to build on First Avenue between 79th and 80th is tearing down all of the small buildings that residences on the streets. We don't know what's happened to those people, and we ought to know. There ought to be some kind of responsibility to the community. It shouldn't be a top-down decision-making because the zoning rules allow this to happen. It should be bottoms up, and the community should have a voice. In addition to the loopholes that were mentioned by the elected officials, I understand that some developers are filing inconsistent and alternative plans with the city that they file to tear down a five-story building and replace it with a six-story building with one city agency and alternatively a much higher building with another city agency. My own speculation is that when you get your foundation or a substantial completion of your foundation in, it stops any future rules from impacting you and stopping the construction. So maybe the substantial completion of a six-story building is bound to come a lot sooner than the substantial completion of a 20, 30, 50, 80-story building. And it shouldn't be, it just shouldn't, it shouldn't be. Um, we're concerned about foreign investors, overseas investors who don't live in these buildings and have an impact on the neighborhood. We're concerned about money laundering. There have been articles in the Times, but I don't know what's actually happened to them. We're concerned about the upward pressure on prices in the neighborhood that come from the construction of buildings intended for the very wealthy. 
uh, small business on Lexington Avenue in the 70s is going out. I went in there to find out why they were leaving. And they said rent was going from $6,200 a month to $20,000 a month. I told them that the city would intervene because that's what the Small Business Services Agency told me. And they said they weren't interested. They just couldn't fight. They were going to retire. This isn't right. There's an impact, as again has been mentioned by the elected officials, on infrastructure. The schools cannot support the additional density. The water mains, the gas leaks, they have been working on a gas leak on Lexington and 83rd Street for months, months. And we're worried about that, about the subways, about public transportation. There, there is no evidence that the city can support the increased density that comes from these much taller and denser buildings. Back to affordable housing for a moment, if you would bear with me. In addition to the super talls and the overdevelopment, for me, the overdevelopment includes the infill projects that the mayor would like to put into uh, some of the NYCHA housing. There's one in the East 90s, the Holmes housing, where the infill project is intended to be 50% affordable housing and 50% um, market rate. We don't know what the affordable housing means, if it's comparing the same number of units or the same amount of floor space. Because 50 one bedroom or studio units is vastly different from 50 three bedroom and four bedroom and penthouse apartments. We cannot get the developer to show up to the community board. So we are, affordable housing is at the top of the list of contextual nature, the transfer of air rights and use of loopholes has led to abuses. Um, the environmental effects, I know the shadows are a huge impact, and I'll just say this because a lot of you are animal lovers, birds have a hard time with these buildings, not because they crash into the glass walls, but because their wings aren't strong enough to override the wind gusts that come from the tall buildings. So I imagine all those little birds. Um, and the impact on rodents, yes, Patch New York has been busy uh, examining the, the, the rats around the city and the neighborhoods. We, they're just hard to control. The east side, the upper side has less green space than other neighborhoods around the city. We're fighting for that. All these towers, the shadows, they kill all of that space. So that's our proposal is to have a 210 foot height limit. It makes sense. It exists in the western part of the district. We don't understand why it cannot exist on the eastern part of the district. And importantly, the communities don't want these buildings. We would like the city to listen to us, to take our views into account, and to have sensible zoning regulations that make sense for the people that live there. There needs to be a mix of people and communities. It can't only be a tall suburb like Greenwich, like Greenwich on steroids. It has to be, and I'm all for I just don't, I, I live in New York, and we, and we fight hard to live in this city, but it needs to be a city with diversity, with energy, and it's not just economic diversity, it's the diversity that comes from a variety of housing, a variety of prices, and a variety of opportunities that people who live shouldn't be pushed out because they can no longer afford to live here. to uh, CBA Chair Lita Camp. I had never seen a chair of any community board like her when I served on board a, a while ago at this point when I was a much younger person if that was possible. It was very pro-development. After five years, and so everyone in this audience, if you live or work in the neighborhood between 59th and 96th or just anywhere in Manhattan, you can apply to be on the community board. That happens in January. Between now and January, please go to meetings. Um, please sign up for their mailing list so you know when the meetings are. You can also find out from my email list. Uh, but show up, consider becoming a public member. I personally give public members a preference. And that being said, anyone who's applied or reapplied to community board eight, six, or 11 has gotten one question from me. We've got a couple others, but one big one. The first question, I think some of the folks in the audience might know it is, how tall is too tall for the Upper East Side? And uh, it might so happen that a folk said, I don't have a problem with, oh, if they say there is no height limit, I can find living in the Jetsons. Those folks have not been recommended by me. And that doesn't happen without a council member and a borough president working together to preserve the next 
organization that we're presenting is uh, Civitas. They received funding from my office to uh, study the tight situation of what's happened. They've been around for about 20 years, or sorry, since the 80s, so now 30 something years. They're also our partners on the Easter Grand Storm. We worked with them through our task force to reimagine the East Side. They were also pivotal in securing $1 million from the Greerly School to renovate a pier at 81st Street that was just the worst part, one of the worst parts of the neighborhood, and so that's going to be rehabilitated. They have a tremendous partner, so if you could please uh, join me in welcoming Sydney Toss and literally anything we can do to get the best out with preferences to an extent, but if I can't get too sound, I will take whatever I can get for some predictability. Please, uh, if you could please give your. Good, e good evening, my name is Alexander Adams, I'm the Executive Director of Civitas, and some of you I see in the audience came to another similar item we did about a week ago. This is a similar presentation, but I'll be giving it, and we're going to have a little bit different, so even if you saw it uh, recently, you'll have something new here. Um, for one thing, I just want to put out there, there's been a couple questions about what are the organizations here at the table doing. And I want to tell you that you heard from one of the organizations that cost almost a million dollars to fight the East 50s project. Between Mass and the Friends of Upper East Side, ourselves, Civitas, and uh, Carnegie Hill, who I've seen here tonight as well, we spent, in going towards a quarter million dollars almost, to fight a project at 96th Street, um, which wants to build over 700 feet. So these are not easy tasks, and what I'm saying is, we need your support, whether it's $50, $100, but we need you as members, as people, but also support, because we can't do it alone. We had to have four organizations come together. So um, we are trying to put sort of our money where our mouth is. Um, so I just want to say that. First, Civitas, so unlike maybe some of the organizations, is a little bit broader. You mentioned the East River Esplanade. We also look at neighborhood sensitive zoning, affordable housing environmental health. Um, our whole annual benefit this year was around small businesses. So we are connected and uh, touching some point of everybody's life in the room, for sure. The other item was, how did we go about this study? Um, and this is sort of a list of some best planning standards as well as our goals as, as an organization. So we mentioned that over 20 years ago we started fighting for mid block. That was the first big fight to save brownstones and things. Um, we do advocate for things like the Second Avenue subway and building around transit. We do advocate for having consistency in urban street walls. Um, what is typical, you've heard today, predictability. Uh, but what we did not want is to create a ton of nonconformity. So that's an important distinction between some of the presentations. You'll see that. And we approach this study in layers, if you want to say, one thing builds on another. So, this was the first fight was for the mid block. This has been, I won't say it's done, because nothing is ever done. But in the most case, mid blocks are fairly well preserved in the Upper East Side. These are some of the iconic buildings. So, I don't think that every tall building is bad, um, but we, as well as the other groups think that the ones going up now have uh, skirted the laws and I would argue are not as good looking as these. <laughs> so
So this is uh, sort of the way things used to be built. This is what is in effect, but uh, typically without any loopholes, without any of this other stuff, gerrymandering going on. We could sort of expect that this was going to give you, on an average block, <coughs> somewhere between 260, maybe 300, 320 feet. But we kind of had an idea of what to expect. So then came, and you've seen this before, all these newer buildings. And that came from a newer idea. But again, even with Tower on the Base and all, usually you could have said buildings would be no taller than around 325, 324, somewhere in that range. And this goes to show your current zoning. I just blew up the block there so you could see it better. What it's showing is the mid blocks again are fairly well protected. What we're really talking about here are the avenues. And so now we sort of, let's say we did phase one, now we have to come back and find phase two. And so we looked at Civitas, we had a, a consultant, DFJ, do this. We actually looked and mapped to all the buildings. So we did each of the avenues, and we looked at all the buildings to get an idea of, of what we're looking at. And we just put the 210 and 400 as a guiding point on it. And this is a blow up. And so when you remember the criteria that I gave you, that we started with, this is where it differs a little bit because we didn't want to create too many non-conformities. So when you're at 210 feet, you, you do end up putting quite a few existing buildings, not just the, the super tall, this is existing. And this is another avenue if you look at it. If you look at two of them together, and then the orange line is representative of your subway stations or First uh, Second Avenue. And so you would think that your subway stations would align with higher density, but they don't always. But I will say there are a few areas. First Avenue is much more tall already. There's a few areas like Second Avenue where there are stretches um, where 210 might not be quite as, as detrimental on our criteria. And this just looked at, this is basically saying, how many buildings do you want to make non-conforming? And, you know, it, it's your preference. Um, we looked at the heights for every 100. We came up with 400 because there were only about 12 buildings at the time that this would make non-conforming. Um, and then we did an entire uh, study similar to some of the other groups and right now it's really come down to I put in high cap versus fixed loophole. We're not saying it has to be one or the other but, um, but definitely on the bottom as I wrote we think that high caps no matter what height that is is a much simpler solution. And I can tell you having been worked for cities before, it's very difficult when it's not simple. It's very easy to make loopholes. It's very easy for lawyers to manipulate things and unintended consequences. So high caps are very easy. There's no interpretation. One of the things right now is not the law. It's how you're interpreting the law. Um, it's very predictable and permanent. Fixing loopholes is a tricky situation. We're not against it. But you're just fixing one thing that is going to come along, there'll be another and another and another. Um, so it may not be quite as permanent. So this gives you the items that um, Civitas has been working on. Now, I I told you there'll be a little bit extra today. We came for both presentations. So I added a little bit extra on my personal knowledge as a planner and working on other cities um, of what you can do. So 
in an ideal planning solution, in an ideal world, when planners get together, um, you could take this analysis, I would say, to, a, to the next step. This is the simple sort of top down. Uh, in this way, you would be mapping out your historic districts and individual landmarks. You could just say, okay, that's off limits. You would map out train stations. I showed you how they don't always correlate with density. Uh, you may have graduating height limits, so it's very easy to say height limits, but maybe it's a bow line or straight line. Um, and we would need permanence to protect the mid blocks. In other words, not just always having that. And you would actually enable, whether it's a community board or other groups, in other cities, they enable these lower boards to make small decisions. So you have signage uh, design guidelines or street safe design guidelines, things like this. They let the lower boards handle this. They don't send everything to daddy at, at city council. And they let people appeal to city council. Why that's important is when we are appealing a process, we're spending big money because we have to go to the court. If we could take a decision for the community board and appeal to the city in other cities, it's much, much cheaper. And that's the first step. And this is just another, I was, we were out on the Esplanade a week ago. We were counting how many people use it. Um, this was another grant with the council person. And I happened to get this shot, and I thought it was just fitting that nobody's talking about it. And I said, who's buying this? Like, if I had a broken brochure, you'd be buying your Upper East Side apartment, complete with views, some emphysema ads from an early market. Like, right above a chimney stack. Um, and it's very little research here. If you look at why they had chimney stacks, it clearly states to get rid of sulfur dioxide, nitrous oxide, and to get things off the ground. Gaseous products are only harmful near the ground. So then I just give you this. So if you want something else for height list, there you go. Respond to the uh, smokestacks. Uh, a lot. The, the Upper East Side has a amazing reputation, and it's because the people who live here, it's also because of folks in marketing and real estate who, who are able to market a building across the street from a steam plant. Uh, that being said, I've been working with the Environmental Protection Chair, Casa Constantinides, to change the type of oil we use in the different power plants that surround the Upper East Side, because we have one in 76. One on 60th, sorry, we have two steam plants, one on 60th, one on 76th, and then we have a big analyst right next to Roosevelt Island, and we're just trying to limit uh, the pollutants that are coming from there. Uh, and then just uh, the CBA chair mentioned the fact that we're losing some of the small businesses. One of the reasons it was important to have a borough president here, Brewer here is first, she got a down zoning on the west side, and second, she got the small business zoning on the west side, which is something that we're hoping we can work with city towns or folks in this room who are willing to dig deep into their pockets. Uh, some seats have opened up, so if you'd like to sit down, we'd love to have you. And so our last presentation before we start digging into the Q&A, it's going to be from friends of the Upper Side Star District. So if you have your cards, please hold them up. If you need another card, raise your hand. We'll be collecting them. and. Uh, with friends, uh, they worked together to get the mid-block protected at 75 feet. Mayor de Blasio proposed something called the MIA Mandatory Exclusionary Housing and Zoning for Quality and Affordability. He wanted to take off the height cap in the mid-blocks. It was one of the things I was able to work with Gail Brewer to stop. And then the other thing we almost succeeded in blocking citywide is uh, in MIHCQA, it says that you can just build taller without building affordable housing. Gail Brewer and I were able to fight and say that in southern Manhattan, so south of 96th Street, I believe, 
if they want additional height, they actually have to give affordability. They just don't get free air. So that was another thing that we were able to do. But I guess the, the thing to know, just as our senator said, even though we're talking about with certainty the, the height cap of 210 feet on the avenues and the height cap of 75 feet in the mid-block, the Real Estate Board of New York is coming. They're coming every single year, and they're not stopping. And for every politician like myself and the borough president and the state senator who are saying no to real estate money, uh, there are many others who are taking as much of it as they can fit in their campaign's pockets. So if you can please try to be in that note and welcoming friends we have for like historic districts who have been fighting this fight to see if you Tenement buildings. 
under standard development assumptions, this usually results in a predictable building in the range of 30 stories or around 300 feet. A side effect of the transfer of development rights is that the adjacent low-scale buildings, which are often tenements on our avenues, are essentially preserved. There's little incentive to redevelop these sites because nothing larger can be constructed. So in these examples, the unused floor area from four tenements was transferred to build these adjacent towers. Uh, so it's a trade-off. It's absolutely a trade-off. You definitely have a tall building, but you also have the historic buildings that remain, um, as well as these small-scale retail spaces that are well-suited to local businesses and often have affordable housing on the upper stories. Um, this additionally adds to the sense of hills and valleys, um, not only on the east-west axis of our neighborhood, but also on the north-south axis of the avenues. This leads to a really incredibly varied physical character uh, on the Upper East Side's Eastern Avenue. And we think this is really a distinctive feature of our neighborhood, this mix of old and new, and kind of a dynamic streetscape. So tower-on-base buildings that transfer their floor area, um, or use benefit from transfer floor area, have become a common pattern on Upper, upper East Side avenues. Usually they clock in at around 300 feet, or about 30 stories. They often have modest ceiling heights of nine and a half to 10 feet. And as I said, these are tall buildings to be sure, but they do form a large portion of the existing context of our neighborhood. When balanced with the desirable side effect of preserving the low-scale tenement buildings and the variety and dynamic mixture of buildings on the street, this is a pattern that Friends supports. And we think buildings of this scale, when only when um, balanced with uh, the preservation of low-scale tenement buildings, is something that's reasonable for our neighborhood going forward. The problem, though, as we see it, has to do with unreasonable towers. These are buildings that take advantage of loopholes in the zoning resolution that boost the height of their buildings by hundreds of feet. These are just a few of the tactics uh, that are shown in some of the buildings under construction across the city. They use things like enormous mechanical spaces, interbuilding voids, and even stilts. All of these act as platforms to raise the height of the buildings. But these spaces are exempt from the building zoning regulations. Developers have found a loophole in this exemption, and it's contributing significantly to buildings that are massively larger than they would have been if these spaces were counted in full. Um, so if you know 432 Park, you can't miss it, of course. It's the poster child for this. But one reason the building got to be so tall is because it has 19 that's 19 floors of fully exempt mechanical spaces and voids. That amounts to 23% or a quarter of its gross area in spaces that don't even count. Um, this building also has average floor heights of 16 and a half feet, um, which boosts the height significantly. And so under zoning, the way it is right now, floor heights count the same whether they're 10 feet or 20 feet, even though this can radically alter the scale of the building overall. Um, but as you know, these are not only happening in Midtown, they're happening right in our neighborhood where for the last 25 years, tower on base zoning has produced a relatively predictable building form. This, this is suddenly, the, loop, the use of the loopholes is suddenly turning tower on, its, tower on base on its head. But we're seeing buildings like 180 East 88th Street that use a variety of tactics to gain height and again are upending the entire notion of tower on base and the predictable building form that it was designed to create. 180 East 88th Street has three-story void in the middle of the building, which is exempt from its floor area. The upper stories also have these ultra-luxury ceiling heights of 16 feet compared to a more typical 10 feet. And finally, uh, the de developer gerrymandered its lot on the 88th Street side. You can see it in that tiny little blue portion towards bottom, just to evade a requirement in zoning that it build a contextual base. So we believe this action undermines both the letter and the intent of the zoning resolution. Um, and Friends, together with Carnegie Hill Neighbors, who have really been a leader on this building in particular, um, and along with the support of our council member Ben Kalos, we've appealed this action at the Board of Standards and Appeals. And so we are uh, awaiting a hearing on that. So just quickly, if, if 180 East 88th Street had used typical development parameters, if it didn't have the void, if it didn't have the huge floor-to-floor -floor heights, 
if it utilized this entire zoning lot, it would basically have fit in with what we're used to seeing in terms of most Upper East Side towers, uh, tower on base buildings, that is. With a height and a range of 300 feet. These two buildings have the same floor area, same number of apartment, apartments and units. Um, they, it, it's just the loopholes that are adding these 200 extra feet. The exploitation of these loopholes are really what have created what we believe is a building that's totally unreasonable for the Upper East Side. Perhaps even more egregious in its use of loopholes is 249 East 62nd Street, which has been proposed with a 150-foot, nearly empty void in the center of the building, literally acting as a pedestal for the upper stories. Not only is this space empty, again, it's also completely exempt from zoning. This results in a building that's over 500 feet, it only has 25 usable stories, and just 83 units. Um, I also know that this has the same designer, Raphael Vignoli, as 432 Park. Uh, this is another project being challenged by friends. Although, so far, the building's department will not acknowledge that there's anything wrong with this. Um, like on 88th Street, the building completely undermines the concept of tower on base. This one doesn't even transfer floor area from the neighboring tenants, so it doesn't even have that kind of side effect that we look for in tower on base and that for 25 years has produced relatively predictable building forms. Um, in addition to challenging these specific buildings, our longer-term goal is to work with the Department of City Planning to actually amend the zoning text to disallow these particular tactics. So in that regard, we see two main loopholes that are essentially changing the allowed bulk of buildings under zoning. There are the inter-building voids that are being used plainly as platforms, and large floor floor heights, which aren't counted at all. Both of these are being fully sanctioned by the Buildings Department, which is approving buildings that gerrymander their lots and contain these loopholes. And ultimately, we think this is a problem because it's just happening. There's no policy intention, there's no public input, there's no directive from our administration or our elected officials. The zoning resolution and its enforcement haven't caught up with construction technologies and the market that are ultimately supporting these tactics. So in terms of solutions, um, we have a number of ideas that we're discussing with policymakers. First, we want to fix the mechanical space exemption. We believe mechanical spaces should be proportional to the size of the building, and they should count for floor area. Friends research shows that other cities regulate interior mechanical space much more strictly than New York. And actually, New York does have some limits on interior mechanical space in lower density districts, outside of Manhattan, so there's precedent for doing this in the zoning text. We also want to devise a rational method to relate ceiling heights uh, to zoning floor area. For example, a 20-foot ceiling should count against your zoning allowance twice as much as a 10-foot ceiling. Um, and then, of course, there's the building department um, and its overly permissive zoning interpretations. DOV is the city agency which has the responsibility to interpret zoning correctly and fairly in a way that's consistent with its legislative intent, not just to create a windfall for high-powered developers. We need the DOV to enforce the basic zoning rules and not simply say yes to overly aggressive tactics that undermine our hard-won zoning. Um, I can also say, though, that there has been some recent traction on some of these issues. At a town hall in January that Councilmember Palo sponsored, the mayor um, in response to a question that I asked, publicly acknowledged that interbuilding voids are a problem, and he committed the Department of City Planning to addressing them. So we have this public statement that we can go back to, to the mayor and the administration and try and hold them accountable. And uh, we have been doing that. Um, in April, the fire department also went on record expressing its concern about the safety of interbuilding voids in relation to the 62nd Street building. Um, and then, most recently in May, friends met with the Department of City Planning for a working session on some of these zoning solutions to the void issue. From our initial discussions with uh, City Planning, we believe that DCP favors limits on the concentration and location of voids within a building, and they plan to develop a targeted solution that addresses the problem specifically in tower and base districts on the Upper East and Upper West sides. Um, so I think the thing that we're working on right now is continuing to press DCP on the urgency of a straightforward zoning solution and also to deal with all of those goals, including floor to floor heights and the ability to gerrymander a zoning lot, not just the voids. These conversations are ongoing, they're in progress. 
Um, and we look forward to also continuing these discussions with our elected officials, who've been essential, as well as all of our neighbors, and that's you, um, to help support Dallas development that's reasonable for our neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. We have 10 minutes left in the plan program, at which point folks can we will let folks go. Uh, the first question was uh, something that I think we omitted through the course, so I'm glad we have the questions. The first question that I'm just going to paraphrase is, which agency sets zoning? So the quick answer is that uh, we don't want responsibility for things. We point at something called the commission, and it's always the commission's fault. So there's a city planning commission. Five of the members are appointed by the five borough presidents. The public advocate has an appointment for six. And uh, if that was the way it worked, we'd be in pretty good shape. But the, the mayor has seven appointments. So my question is, who does the city planning commission work for? That's correct. Uh, so ultimately, you have the city planning commission, but they also serve at the pleasure of those who appoint them. So um, when we wanted to rezone the Sutton area, the city planning commission was dead set against it, and it took us several years and uh, over a million dollars to force their hand to do the right thing. Uh, that being said, uh, what we've heard is a lot of different presentations and. What we have found so far is that city planning has been most friendly to the solution put forward by friends. That being said, uh, they are here, they can answer questions. When I saw the presentation the first time, it was hard for me to believe, but they are such trusted partners. They have helped landmark uh, so many parts of our district that it, it, sometimes it's just a matter of getting to know, it, getting into the facts and understanding what they're proposing. I, I understand that so far we're, we're not necessarily hearing everything we want to hear, but I prefer to deal in reality and challenges and letting us know what we're up against uh, to do so. Uh, one of the questions is we've been asking, everyone's been asking a little bit about financial support, and so uh, I think multiple folks have mentioned it who spoke, but if each group could say where their website is or phone number or best way of reaching out if folks are interested in financially supporting it. We'll just start from right to left. You can find the Municipal Art Society on the web at mas.org. You can find the East River 50s Alliance at erfa, e -R -F -A dot nyc. Friends of the Upper East Side is at www.friends-uefs for Upper East Side.org. Uh, there's so many times, and honestly, I'll tell you, the easiest thing to do is go to the back of the room and get one of the blue brochures, and uh, you can sign up to our newsletter and all, all our information is there. Uh, but www.sovitasnyc. What? If you can repeat it. Yes, civitasnyc.org. But the easiest is to get a brochure in the back. I think most of the groups have a brochure back. Without saying anything about taking money, Community Board 8's website is cb8m. Don't forget the m because there are cb8s around the city. Uh, thank you. And in terms of if you're interested in specifically just supporting the cb 8 210 effort. We are happy to work with you and CBA to try to find a fiscal conduit. If you represent the nonprofit in the neighborhood that's interested in being a fiscal conduit, we'd love to. The next question is uh, what is the current zoning throughout the district? And so I got in trouble with my sister because whenever I go over her house, I run over the computer and say, You have to see this website. So this one is hard because the city does things to make it easy. The acronym you need to remember is ZOLA. Z O L A. And then if you type in NYC, it will offer you ZOLA, NYC's zoning and land use map. Isn't that easy to find and remember? 
uh, but we can go there. And anyone who's had me at their Ben and Your building where I do this has been so happy that I did this. But you can do this, and, and this is how I spend my free time on weekends. But you can zoom around the city, and you can see what the zoning is. And so I figure if you teach a person to fish, they will be able to do so. So we're just zooming in as much as we can. So this is pretty much what the Upper East Side looks like. And so you can click on one of these things, and when you click on it, it will actually even give you a link so you can learn more. So on the avenues, you have a C1-9, which is basically a tower on base. And everyone should remember to leave their cell phones off at the events. Uh, and so you have the tower on base on the avenues. And that's first, second, third. Uh, and those build, those buildings, with if they follow all the laws, shouldn't get too tall. Then you have in the mid blocks. That's the RAP that's capped at 75 feet. And uh, then you have the R10As on those cross avenues. And uh, so what you see is the streets where it exists, and that's capped at 210 feet. And uh, basically, if you're on Lexington, that's capped at 195. And then from Park, Madison, Fifth is capped as part of a special parks historic district at 210 feet. But the key thing is that there's little places where things are always a little bit different, so you can check for your own block. Once you get a little bit further north in the district, we have a manufacturing district, uh, because we used to make asphalt in the neighborhood. So you can actually look around at your block and see what can be built there. You can click on it, it's Zola NYC. If you have any trouble with it, you can stop by our office, we're happy to help you use it, but this is, I spend so much time on this website, it's not even fun. So uh, now you can look up for yourself. Uh, the key thing is our mid blocks are protected, the rest is not. How do we find out what's planned in our neighborhood before it's too late and also energize our board members and neighbors? So I believe Friends just built a new tracker, which I just found out about tonight. If you can tell us uh, how to get there. Uh, sure. If you go to our website, which is www.friends-ues.org, on the uh, right-hand column, about halfway down, there's a little button that says Development Tracker Map. You go to it, it brings up a Google map that, we've, uh, that we're continually updating whenever we find out about new developments. Each dot on the map leads to a dedicated page on our site um, where we are compiling news articles, DOB permits, as much information that's confirmed, <laughs> so not rumors, not trying not to um, traffic in, in information that may not be accurate, but confirmed public information will go up on our website. If you know of something that if we don't have up there, call us, call the office, I will probably answer the phone, um, and we'll, we'll put it on the website because um, we want to have a consolidated place for people to go to look for up this kind of information. So, the, so it's right up there, it's a link off the main page, you can see it down there, but the, the honest answer of how do we find about, about development? We find out about it from you. Because you look behind your building, because you walk past the building and you see all the lights are out. Because you work in real estate, and there's nothing wrong with it, you're my constituents, so like, there's nothing wrong with it. And you get a fundraising prospectus. That's how we found out about the place development. Somebody in real estate got handed this perspective asking them to invest in the project. And they said, no, thank you. And then even though it had a non-discrimination, a non-disclosure agreement, they still handed it to me. And we handed it to the press. And uh, everyone knew what was happening. So the, the honest answer is, it is whistleblowers like you who are the ones who tell us what's happening. We also pay attention to industry trade publications like The Real Deal and EMB and other folks. But the key thing is, it's neighbor to neighbor. It's somebody saying, you know, my neighbor for 30 years, I saw them in the park and they said they were moving out of the city because a developer offered them $30,000 
And I thought that was strange because his neighbor got offered $60,000, so I told him about that, but he had already taken the money and it was too late. And then the next neighbor got more or whatever, but at the same time, these folks, we lose them from our neighborhoods. Uh, they got the money, but we lose, and the neighborhood loses because we lose them. So that is great. The next question, is there a website to show which politicians are taking real estate money? The answer is no, and there should be. I'm working on legislation that would require when people disclose, uh, when they give money to elected officials, they would have to say where their money comes from. In the meantime, this is another website that is really easy to remember. There is a website called the Campaign Finance Board, and it's simple, it's nyccfb.info. Yes, .info is actually a real government website. And then up there, you click Follow the Money, because that is intuitive. Then once you're on the Follow the Money page, you have to select uh, Camp... Uh, you have to make sure to click Follow the Money NYC. And then once there, you can type in the name of a candidate, and then you can see whether or not they have real estate uh, money. So uh, it's incredibly simple, incredibly easy. All you have to remember is go to nyccfb.info, then click follow the money, click the right follow the money link, then go to the place, find the candidate name, and then once you find the candidate name, you can, <coughs> you can do a search, and then you can, give it a second because it works really efficiently, and then I like to sort by the amount, because it turns out that when you're taking real estate money, it's not coming from um, from folks, and then you would just uh, go down, and so you see, uh, one thing is a homemaker. There are a lot of homemakers who give a lot of money, and uh, sometimes they have the same last names as other people. So, um, in this case, there's an attorney, I don't know if it's a real estate attorney, uh, but usually by now we would have gotten into spoke. Oh, I sorted by date. Thank you. Which one it is? Sorry, I'm looking from across the room. There we go. Uh, so, a lot of folks didn't mention who their employer was. And then as you go further down, uh, we should bring this to the attention of the uh, Campaign Finance Board that no one has any employment if they gave a check for $4,950. So anyway, normally uh, it should work and you should be able to see things, but my staff is reminding me that I have more questions. Uh, Sorry, I'm going to hand it off. How will the city handle the drain on resources from more over more developments on transportation, water, schools, sanitation, all from increased densities to the panel? How is the city so with new development come new families, and new families need things, they need street to walk on, they need public transportation and an overcrowded subway to ride on and try to jam into. They need school seats when we don't actually have school seats for the kids who already live here. How is the city dealing with this challenge? We need to push the city to invest in our neighborhoods. And the city has tried to take a number of shortcuts when it comes to providing this critical infrastructure. They've figured out how to get how to make deals with developers to build our schools, to build our open space. And unfortunately, the hard truth is we need the city to just flat out invest directly. Because when we make deals with developers, uh, like um, like was mentioned before, the, uh, the development on uh, East 96, East 97th Street at the uh, Marx Brothers Playground, we wind up with buildings that are out of scale and out of context, like the ones that we, uh, we discussed tonight. And we need the city to double down and um, find innovative policies to, um, to, bring in, to bring in the infrastructure that's needed, the schools, the parks, uh, and everything else. 
When my child was applying to middle school, the developer, we looked at Eastside Middle, and the developer of that building, on first in 90th, talked about how it was building a new version of Eastside Middle, except that it was not a complete school. This is my recollection. They left out either labs, an auditorium, or a library, I don't remember which. It wasn't complete, and they got more height than right. Other cities require things to developers. New York City seems to ask very meekly and with a lot of excuses for the developers to do something and always in exchange for something else. Maybe that's not how it should be. Um, and also, we had uh, at Burma the experience that we were required to do a very costly, very time-consuming environmental study. Environmental studies address many of these issues. We at IRPA had to do it. Developers don't have to. That's a grotesque inequity. Thank you. Uh, one of the things we are looking at is how to change the environmental review process. It's called CEQRA, and it's something that we're working with our state lawmakers on. So it is 8.05, so I want to thank folks for bearing with us. Uh, we still have the room for a little bit. It's cooled down a little bit, so we're going to keep trying to get through some of the questions until about 8.30. Uh, a lot of folks did not share their names on their cards. I don't know if I'm going to get to all the questions tonight. We're trying to group things together so that we can get as many questions answered as possible. My email is bkalos at benkalos.com. It is on the flyer, it is on the newsletter, it is on everything you have right now. If you did not get your question answered, and you did not put your name on one of these cards, you can email me. We will make sure to get it to the right panelist or just get you the correct answer. Given the number that we're seeing here, just we usually try to get back to people within 24 hours, so we will probably acknowledge your question and say give us some time to get back to you. Uh, something that was brought to our attention through the 79th Street Neighborhood Association was just about affordable housing. Uh, if the City Planning Commission and the administration and the mayor are talking about mandatory inclusionary housing, how they're going to build 300,000 new units of affordable housing. Is it overdeveloped, destroying affordable housing? And if all this affordable housing is even building 50% affordable, uh, while it's displacing so much, uh, how do we make sure that people have a place to live? Significant issue for the community board. We don't have any answers because we don't get answers. We don't have statistics. We push and we push and we push. We recognize how significant it is to the community, to the people who live here, to the people who ought to be able to stay here, to have affordable housing. And not just affordable housing for people who earn 100 or 125 percent of the AMI, but affordable housing for people who really can afford the housing. Um, for all different levels, and we don't have any solutions because we don't know what's going on. We only suspect that numbers are being diminished of affordable units because we don't know what they're putting into buildings and what's being lost and what kinds of um, apartments were being lost. I think we've all read about Jared Kushner and how he did not tell the truth to the city about the number of subsidized units, rent subsidized units, in, uh, rent stabilized units in the building or rent controlled. And we're just, we're just very, very concerned. We don't have an answer. Um, and I would also add that one problem with the city's mandatory inclusionary housing policy, the way that it was enacted, is that it ties production of affordable housing to, uh, it's triggered by a rezoning. And so that means when, when developers are required to build affordable housing is when that neighborhood is being upzoned. And therefore, we'll see a lot of other non-affordable housing, most likely, um, as part of that. Um, and so I think that, you know, demanding from our government a one-for-one -one replacement of any affordable housing units that are lost with new affordable units is absolutely essential. I just want to add one thing. There's a project I related on Roosevelt Island. There is a building that's only affordable with its varying measures of the AMI percentages of it. But in exchange for only 30 years, for a lot of the units of affordable housing, they can transfer, in my recollection of the calculation is correct, and people on the housing committee tell me if I'm wrong, 84,000 square feet of air rights to the upper east side.
sorry. It may be Queens, but I think they were talking about the other time. In any event, stay tuned. Come to the zoning meeting that has not yet been scheduled where that will be taken. Yes, and there's always the issue of the Somebody, sorry, okay. So there's a further question just to dig in a little bit deeper on the City Planning Commission. So the City Planning Commission has the authority, they have the Department of City Planning, so they can originate zoning tax amendments, they can originate zoning plans like mandatory inclusionary housing and, uh, and, uh, and change zoning. Technically, when our chair of Community Board 8 has a resolution in hand saying we want to R10A, they're, they're supposed to work for the community planning board and do what they're told. But again, who, do the, who does the city planning commission work for? Okay. And so they have the authority, they get to have a binding vote on changes to our zoning. Uh, does Community Board 8 have a binding vote? Can you say it after the mic? We do not. So, uh, so, so that was what my colleague Councilor Powers was speaking to and what Community Board 8 is taking a head on. So uh, I will let them ask. So to Community Board 8, how do we change it so that the Community Board has a voice? That is binding. It's, it's part of it is who is on the various city Mission. Part of it is what's in the city charter. That's why we have the new committee, and that's why we are asking for a seat at the table with the city planning commission. They have shown far, so far shown not much interest in uh, considering our position. We have to fight just to get invited to it. And so there's a charter revision commission, and there's and so you can testify before the charter revision commission, either the mayor's commission or the broader one led by our borough president Gail Brewer. Community Board 8 now has a committee focused on this, and uh, we can rewrite it. So right now, Community Board gets a non-vote binding resolution. It goes to the borough president, who has a non-binding resolution, and then it goes to the city planning commission, who votes on it, and then it goes to the city council, who can sometimes vote it down, but very rarely, and then it goes back to city planning. But at the end of the day, city planning holds all the cards, and again, the City Planning Commission has appointed seven people from the... Okay, and uh, yes. The other piece is uh, somebody wanted to know which organization our first speaker came from. I mean, I'm Robert Joseph, I'm from the Municipal Art Society of New York, a lot of people call us MAS. It seems like the speakers kept talking about feet. What about stories? Uh, is there what? Well, how how many stories is a 200 foot 210 foot building? How many stories is a 400 foot tall building? And is the setback rule still in effect? Um, I'll speak to that question first. Um, I think that typically when we're used to seeing buildings that have 10 feet floor to floor height, you could reasonably say that a 20 story building would be around 200 feet. Um, the reason that we're talking more in feet rather than stories is because we're starting to see buildings that have 16 foot floor to floor heights, 20 foot floor to floor heights, and so the number of stories becomes almost meaningless when you're talking about the scale of that building and its impact on the neighborhood. Um, in terms of the setback rule, um, it is still in effect. It depends, it, different setbacks are required depending on um, exactly where the building is, so how on base, for example, I think that's the question that you're referring to, I hope, um, requires a setback after the contextual base of either 10 or 15 feet, depending on whether it's a narrow or wide street. And if you have more questions, um, I'm happy to talk to you. I would, I would tell you that, uh, yeah, typically speaking, you can always in history, you sort of say 10 feet or a floor. You know, it's very easy, 20 floor the buildings, 200 feet, whatever. Um, but we're not so much against the 
the height of the floors because, to be honest, there are advantages to high floors, environmental advantages, um, and other things. And that's not really where they're getting the loophole. They're really getting the loophole out of these boys. So, I mean, when you can count one floor for 150 feet, I mean, that's really where you're getting the loophole, not, let's say, two feet per floor or two feet per floor. So, I would, I would focus on the, the gerrymandering and the, the large mechanical spaces and things. So, we got a lot of questions that were on the exact topic. We have one that was a little bit on the periphery. Uh, so, one of the tools that we use for preservation is called Landmark. And uh, the, the organization we work most closely with uh, landmarking is Friends of the Upper East Side Historic District. And so there was a very long question, but I'm just going to summarize it, about uh, a slew of buildings on East 86th Street between York Avenue and the East End. And uh, why, it, and the fact that there, uh, the person notes that uh, there were, they were a Georgian style of building and uh, that it was a 1939 construction, and so the question was why couldn't these six-story buildings uh, be preserved, and uh, why is it going to be a 23-story IRS? Um, so I think that this question is referring to a development that's at the corner of 86 and York. Um, around the surrounding the mansion and diner, um, where to be constructed there, I believe it's, as Ben said, a 23-story building that I believe will be in large part senior housing, if I'm remembering the site correctly, with maybe I'm not, but we can talk after. Um, so the, the building, the site that I'm thinking about uh, on 86th Street, so 86th Street is one of the thoroughfares that does have a 210-foot height limit um, that is able to be bonused up a little bit beyond that with if, if affordable housing for seniors is provided. Um, the Georgian building, I think, that is being asked about is adjacent to this site. Um, and I will say that the Friends has a list of about 35 buildings that we are working on um, that we've submitted requests for evaluation to the Landmarks Commission. Um, that's the agency that has the power to designate individual landmarks and historic districts. Um, we would very much like to increase landmark protection in Yorkville in particular. Um, the, the, I think that we're seeing a really unprecedented amount of development in this neighborhood, especially um, as a I think, side effect of the 2nd Avenue subway construction and, and the development that that is all incentivizing. Um, the Landmarks Commission has been really stonewalling us. <laughs> we are working very hard to continue to um, have, have those conversations about significant buildings. In our neighborhood, um, the, we we're also about to get a new chair of the Landmarks Commission, as you may have read in the news. And so, um, we hope that that person will be a little bit more sympathetic to to our neighborhood and its historic character. I'm going to add one other thing. That's um, again, it's it's sort of ironic that other cities actually look to New York City's code and copy some of the things. Um, and yet, when I came here, the exact things that we copied in other cities are not interpreted and enforced the way the reason why we actually copied it. Um, and one of the things that you have to think about, I think, in historic preservation, which you, you're not doing in this city right now, is there are different levels of preservation. And one of the things that's popular now is creating neighborhood conservation districts, which are not quite as uh, prescriptive and not quite as uh, onerous, but do allow some degree of preservation. Uh, so, and the other one is most cities allow groups like Friends to submit applications directly to the commission, and they have to take them up. They don't ask to take things up. You don't have to have a sponsor and all this. Some cities even let any resident, but most allow an organization that is specialized in that to submit. Um, so those are some things you need to work on. So 
So I want to thank folks who stayed past the 8 o'clock. I thought we might have till 8.30. We were asked to leave at 8.15. So I'm going to just answer some quick last rapid questions. Uh, can we limit air rights? Uh, yes, that is something we're working with friends in the Upper Side Historic District in terms of the air rights loopholes there. Also, at the city toss, if there's a 400 foot pipe cap, that creates a limit on just how much you can uh, stack. So, those are two folks who are working. How can we stop empty pied de terres, uh, whose owners are here only a couple of days a year or just using to store their money? Uh, we've done a lot on the federal level to uh, check for uh, money laundering. That being said, I'm interested in working with any attorneys. Uh, the United States has a, uh, a, a legal case law basis against preservation of uh, property. And so um, basically there are some jurisdictions outside of the United States where in order to own something, you have to live there. And uh, the only people who can own apartments are people who live there. I like that idea because we could force them to pay their income tax here, which would be if these are billionaires, three or four percent of billions of dollars. You can even go nuts in New York City and say, if you if your income is over a billion dollars, we're going to charge you five or ten or thirty percent. Who knows? Uh, the other piece is uh, somebody asked, how much control does the state have over the floor area ratio of twelve? Complete. So that is why state senator fighting to get keep that limit is important, and who is responsible for enforcing environmental uh, review. I think I will turn to MAS, and uh, that was the speed round, so please make it quick. It's not enforced, that's the problem, and we want it to be, it should be. Uh, and, and so I think those are the key things. We usually work with groups like everyone at this table, and Carnegie Hill is notably missing, they've been a key partner, where when there's a development and somebody tells us about it, we call in the big guns, and these are them, and say, this doesn't look right. Tell us what's wrong or what's right or what we can do here, whether it's challenging it because they're not following environmental review or challenging because they have a weird 10-foot outlaw or, or what have you. So um, I want to thank everyone who's here. There's still folks in back where you can sign up. I want to thank you for joining us this year. And uh, I want to thank my staff. And uh, I know there's a lot of thank yous. You can email me at bkalos at benkalos.com. Call me at 212-860-1950. I'm actually on paternity leave, even though you might not know it. Uh, and, yes. and I wanted to make sure we kept doing our annual events and I showed up for those. Uh, that being said, I've been told that it is time to go tuck in my daughter. Uh, and I haven't missed one of those yet. So uh, thank you, and I hope you had a good time. We look forward to it.